And welcome to everybody, and thank you. I know many of you have come a long way, uh, and not a very convenient time, and it really is very much appreciated. Um, and I thought long and hard putting the lecture together, and it, I think what it really made me do was reflect and to realise how lucky I am to have worked with so many uh, wonderful people. And so as I try uh, over the next 45 minutes to explain to you why I've given the lecture such a, a strange title, I'm also really going to use my main theme, and that is to thank as many people as I can uh, for their help over the years. So I'll see if I can get this to work. So I'm going to start from the top, and I hope you can see this. Um, and this, these are my parents, and they were the ones who inspired me to do medicine. Paul, my father, was a GP. My mother, Anne, who's here today, um, was a physiotherapist. And I was lucky enough to have two sisters, Roz and Belle. And luckily, they saw the light and decided that the last thing in the world they wanted to do was medicine, and they went to university to read the arts. Um, but for some reason, I was inspired to do medicine, and it was a major part of our household. Um, and we had a family joke that we really couldn't get through a meal without the phone ringing for my father with a patient or my mother having to answer for a patient. And I think we all remember fondly the sight of my father leaving in the middle of the night to do a visit, uh, putting his suit on over his pyjamas. And, and frankly, the patient didn't need anything else. Just the sight of that was enough to cheer them up or terrify them sufficiently. Um, anyway, I moved on to Charing Cross Medical School and had a wonderful six years there. And I was lucky enough to meet uh, two people while I was there, Patrick Venables and Tiny Maney. And it was them who introduced me to autoimmune disease and to rheumatology. And it was them who really gave me the inspiration and the thought that an academic career might be worth pursuing. And I did a project with them at the old Kennedy Institute here in West London. And of course, Tiny then subsequently through the Kennedy led it to one of its major medical advances in recent years, the development of anti-TNF therapy. And I did a project with them and it introduced me to basic science for the first time. And I was lucky enough to publish this paper. And the reason I show that is because it's to pay tribute to Patrick, who pushed me forward uh, as the first author for this paper, which I thought <clears throat> was an extremely generous thing to do for someone who was building his own academic career at that time. Uh, and it's something that I've always appreciated. And Patrick was also gave me the idea of a project to do on my elective. Um, so I'd chosen to go with my great friend, Rob Schuster-Bruce, who uh, is a GP now in Poole to this hospital, Kiambu District General Hospital. And Patrick said, well, the most practical project is to collect some sera and bring them home for analysis. So rather naively, we thought, fine, we, we set about this. We packed our luggage with numerous needles and syringes, and even the newly designed hepatitis B vaccine, which we had in, uh, uh, in cooling flasks to inject ourselves with doses two and three while we were there. And remarkably, this all got onto Olympic Airways without any problem at all. Um, but we did run into a bit of a problem in customs when, unbeknownst to us, my uh, mother had very kindly, thinking two lads going to Kenya, the last thing they're going to do is wash their clothes while they're there, had slipped in some aerial into the luggage, which proved a little bit difficult to explain uh, when we got to, to Kenyan customs. But we, we survived the initial hiccup and we arrived in uh, Kiambu. And I'd like to thank the patients and the staff from the hospital. They were wonderful. But they also entered into this research project uh, with vigor. And it, generally, it went pretty well, except on one occasion, the nurses and the outpatients said to me that they thought I should leave from the back entrance of the hospital for a few days, because one of the patients had given blood but had thought he was going to be receiving a special treatment and was waiting outside with a machete, which was uh, off-putting. But I survived that, and we duly collected the samples. And again, I mean, naively, we put them in cool bags, put them in our luggage, and we were back on to Olympic Airways. And nobody seemed to worry. And then I realized that my mother truly loved me when she stored 150 blood samples from Kenya in her deep freeze at home <laughs> until I went to Northwick Park for, for analysis. Um, but there is a serious side to the project as well. Um, and that is the following. Kiambu lies here, about 25 kilometers north of Nairobi. And at the time we were doing this work, the AIDS epidemic was beginning to develop in Africa. Despite this, this was a heading from the Daily Nation newspaper in Nairobi at the time. We categorically refute any allegations that there is an AIDS scare in Kenya. And of course, this was politically motivated. This was to preserve the tourist industry in Kenya, which even in those days was worth 250 million pounds uh, per million dollars per annum. 
So we were very lucky. Uh, we published this work in the New England Journal of Medicine. Um, and I have to say, my impact factors have never quite reached that level since. So I peaked, <laughs> peaked early on, the, on that. But we, we published it off the back of a study that came out earlier that year from another group who'd been working in Nairobi. And what they'd shown was that in a sexually transmitted diseases clinic, by this stage, 1985, 66% of the sex workers were HIV positive, 8% of the other patients, and already 2% of the medical staff. But only 30 kilometers north, less than 1% of a rural community had HIV. So the message was that education was still a viable option. But of course, politically, this was impossible. And it wasn't until 1999 that President Moore even recognized that there was AIDS uh, in Kenya. And of course, history has told the story. So following that, I um, qualified, which was a relief. Uh, I did a job at Charing Cross Hospital. Then I moved to King Edward VII in Windsor. Uh, and then to the Whittington for a year before the London Chest and the Brompton. And it wasn't until 1989, which, as Marina says, is longer ago than I'd like to recall, that I first worked at the Hammersmith Hospital. Well, I did the renal job with Charles Pusey, who I'm delighted to say uh, is here tonight, and Andy Rees. And I hope he won't take offence when I say that I think I would summarise the job up as challenging. Uh, and in fact, my colleague, Andrew Bishop, said he would rather gnaw his own leg off than do the job again. <laughs> Um, so it, it, it was, it, it was a, a bit of a stretch. Um, and I can actually remember leaving the Hammersmith Hospital on the last day of that job, driving down the M3 and taking my hands off the wheel and punching the air, thinking, <laughs> I'm never going there again. Um, and in fact, I really branched out at that point and went all the way to Slough for a year uh, in a job that I very much enjoyed, but slightly overlooked the fact that it was linked to the Hammersmith. So a year later, I'm returning to East Acton, which... For those of you who are not lucky enough to know, it is a historically important part of London, not least because our neighbour is Wormwood Scrubs uh, Prison, and we sit very happily side by side. And I, in these days where one can rate anything you like on the internet, I was somewhat relieved to see that uh, HM Prison Wormwood Scrubs only <laughs> achieves 3.1, and Hammersmith <laughs> makes 4.2, 4 uh, which, uh, which is a relief, but room for some improvement. Um, but what the RPMS, which was then the Royal Postgraduate Medical School, did have was a, a group of inspirational staff, and, and that was its great attraction. And I was lucky enough to join the rheumatology unit that was led by uh, Mark Warport and Doran Haskell, who you'll meet later, Alex So, uh, Kevin Davis, who's kindly come up from Sussex, Marina, you've already met, and Bernie Morley. And I'd really like to give thanks to them for all the guidance and support, for the teaching, uh, and for setting such an inspirational environment, and for their generosity over the years, which I still benefit from, uh, and for their friendship. And it really is much appreciated. And um, here we are in 1994, I think it is. Uh, uh, Marina will probably correct me. But I mean, really, only an academic unit could take a picture as bad as that, I think. <laughs> I mean, it, 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 it's, a sh it, it's shocking, but what I think it conveys is the fun and the camaraderie and the enjoyment, and that Kevin and Marina are the two brightest people, because they both come out in their coats, knowing this was going to take a long time to get sorted out. Um, but I joined the clinical staff, and this was a very productive time for me, because we were encouraged to do research, time was made available in our program to do research, and we were helped to do it. And I think... This is something that has been lost for our current SBRs due to the rigours and, dare I say, the box ticking that's required for the NHS e-portfolio. And I think that's, that's a shame uh, and is having an impact. But this study on the left um, is a biomarker study I did with Pankaj Kapahi and Dorian Haskard. And the reason I show it is that I presented this at the old Hammersmith staff round. And it was the time, the only time, in fact, my father visited me in, a, in, the, in the hospital. And he was very ill at the time and was having chemotherapy. But he really enjoyed the robust nature of the old staff round and particularly enjoyed me struggling to defend my work. Um, he was also very grateful for Dorian for looking him after him uh, during the time and showing him around. And it was also a time when I had my first foray into vasculitis. I won't go into the details here, but I'll come back to why this is of interest later on. So then uh, I was lucky enough to... Um, to get through um, the help of Dorian to join his lab to get an MRC uh, clinical training fellowship. And the interest we had was in the endothelium that lines all of our blood vessels. And the concept that there may be heterogeneity in the endothelium that lines different types of blood vessels. 
uh, here an artery and, and here a vein. And if you look um, morphologically at small vessels, you can see that they are clearly different if you look in the lung versus the liver, for example. So we developed uh, mechanisms whereby we could isolate the endothelial lining from small vessels here from the human skin and larger vessels, and then began to study their function. And I was lucky enough to work with all of these people, Laura Meyer and Ted Keelan, Pankaj I've mentioned, Helen Yarwood, Kate Sugars, Claire Stocker, Simon Wellicom, two New Zealand colleagues, Peter and Andrew, and we were subsequently joined by Olivier Harari and uh, Julia, Julia McHale. And they made it a wonderful environment, especially for a naive medic who wasn't used to doing science. And we found that, um, indeed, there was heterogeneity, and we, we showed that this molecule uh, was expressed by the endothelium for the first time, and it was highly expressed on small vessels in the skin. This molecule was regulated, so during inflammation, the level of expression changed. And if you ligated the molecule, it transmitted signals into the cell that suggested functional importance. And subsequently, it has been shown to be important in leukocyte trafficking and in angiogenesis, the development of new blood vessels. So uh, that would fit with its, its anatomical localization. But during this work, I began to get interested in an area that has taken me forward from there. And that is mechanisms that injure our endothelium. We know that some diseases attack blood vessels directly. So here's vasculitis with disruption of this small vessel, some local hemorrhage and thrombus. But what we were really interested in were circulating factors in the blood in patients with chronic inflammatory disease. Because it was clear that if your endothelium is dysfunctional, this is the first step in the process of atherosclerosis, the cause of heart attack and stroke that occurs in all of us to some extent. Um, and the concept was that um, patients with inflammatory diseases had an accelerated process. And Dorian was one of the rheumatologists, the first people to recognize this. And these are examples from patients of mine. And again, I'd like to thank the patients for being so willing to be involved in research. So all of these patients have different inflammatory diseases, but all of them are at risk of a more rapid progression of atherosclerosis, so of premature heart attack and stroke. Now, the mechanisms for this, even some years later, are not entirely clear. Um, and this is a, a subject of a, of a review we've written recently. Um, but there has been a lot of scientific interest in why this might be the case. And here I want to pay particular thanks to the Arthritis Research Campaign, now known as Arthritis Research UK, because it was at this stage of my career that uh, <clears throat> they took on my funding. They funded my salary for eight years as an intermediate fellow and as a senior research fellow and provided research uh, funding on top. And I'd like to thank particularly Madeleine Devey and Alan Silman, Michael Packnick and Liz Waterman, who I'm delighted to say is here today, because that was a critical point for me in my career. And it's a great privilege for me now to be um, chair of their Research Education and Capacity Committee and also to have served on their Fellowship Implementation uh, Committee to carry on research funding for, for other fellows. So they funded uh, work, but you can't do work in an isolated environment. You have to work, or you're much better if you can work within a unit. And this is where I really want to thank Dorian Haskard, who has led our unit for many years extremely effectively. Uh, his enthusiasm for clinical and basic and translational research is undiminished, uh, and he's provided the environment that uh, has made this work possible, and I'm, I'm extremely grateful to his advice and friendship over the years. I accept that under circumstances, some circumstances, had to seek help from a higher authority or seek strength from higher authority <laughs> when driven to distraction. But I think we were all uh, extremely uh, gratified when his contribution was recognized last year uh, to cardiovascular immunology in the uh, circulation, which is the leading international vascular biology journal. So, Doreen, thank you very much. So the work that ARUK funded, or at least part of it, was looking at how the complement system could damage the endothelium. Now, the complement system is critical in all of us for protection against infection, for example. But if it's overactivated or activated for too long, it can damage uh, tissues and it can be a contributor to diseases, including rheumatoid arthritis, SLE, and indeed atherosclerosis shown here. So the interest in our work was in the, the molecules that we all have that keep this system under control, and particularly decay accelerating factor and CD59. And we asked the question, could they be therapeutically enhanced to minimize injury to the endothelium? 
So this uh, is one slide that seems to summarize years of my life, but um, the work was done in collaboration with Elaine Liddington, with Safer Ahmed, and with Anne Kindalira. And what we showed was that this molecule particularly was regulated, its levels were enhanced during inflammation, during new blood vessel, blood vessel formation to help provide protection as part of an innate system. But we also showed that the cholesterol-lowering drugs, which I've no doubt one or two of us are on uh, in the room today, help induce the expression of this molecule. And this minimizes deposition of complement onto the endothelial cell surface and minimizes complement injury. So it's beneficial. Whereas this drug, cyclosporin A, which is also a critically important drug used in patients after organ transplantation, has the opposite effect by down-regulating these molecules. So it was the first step for us towards identifying the selection of individual drugs that may or may not be of benefit, benefit to individual patients. And I'll develop that a little bit later. So then I moved on after my fellowship to, uh, the, to the latest phase of funding. And I, again, really want to pay tribute to the charitable sector within the UK for providing research funding. And I've been lucky enough to have funding from the BHF since 1997. We've also had funding through uh, the chair for Doran Haskard, for the, our center, for the unit, and also strategic funding within the new building. And I'd like to recognize Jeremy Pearson and Peter Weisberg. But I've also been lucky enough to have funding from the MRC, from the Wellcome Trust, from the Rose Trees Trust, from Vasculitis UK, and John and Susan are here tonight, which I'm very grateful for, as well as internal charities as part of the trust and the college. So I'm extremely grateful for all of this support over the years. And again, the unit depends on the people who work within it. Um, and I've got some, some excellent uh, senior investigators who work with me in the department, who collaborated with me over the years, and all the members of their groups who are here tonight to thank them all for the fun environment and, and, and the, the collaborative spirit that operates within our unit. And particularly Anna Randi, Joseph Boyle, Claire Shovelin, and Graham Birdsey. And we're all kept in, uh, in order and, and majorly uh, entertained by Grace Nakati. And I'd like to thank her for all her hard work uh, as well. So now there is a little bit more science for the next few slides. So, and then I'll, I'll change tack a little bit. So one of the advantages of working in a bigger unit is that you can be more ambitious about what you take on. And so we were interested in the effects of blood flow on the endothelium and its effect on, on vascular injury. And here I'd like to pay tribute to uh, Peter Weinberg and Rob Krams, who work here in bioengineering, because it was by talking to them and, and getting their understanding of the physics uh, of blood flow that really helped us in this work. And the concept is fairly straightforward, that this is the, a model of the carotid bifurcation, the main artery in our neck. And there's a straight part of the vessel shown here and a branch point here. And the physical force exerted by blood flow here uh, is felt to be protective, enhances protective genes. Whereas you'll see on the video, the flow around the branch point is much more disturbed and reverses and is pro-inflammatory. And if you can see the video, I'm not sure how good the lighting is, but if you can see the video run, you'll see the changes in flow. So it's straight and parallel to the surface here, but at the branch point, there are eddies of flow that reverse. And this appears to be pro-inflammatory. And if you look at the model here, which is, um, an aorta, is an arteriogram from a patient showing a normal artery in the straight part, but here, an abnormal lesion growing into the artery. And this is atherosclerosis and predisposes to stroke. So Anne Kindalira came to the lab, and she had the hypothesis that the complement protective molecule CD59 would be highly expressed in the straight part of the vessel. And indeed, she was able to show that. It's the red lining here. You probably can't see, but it was highly expressed in this area. And she said, I think it'll be reduced at this site. And so here's a section from here, and the expression was markedly reduced. And then Doran's group went on to show that if you took a CD59 animal, that this animal was uh, prone to accelerated atherosclerosis. So she was right that the regulation of that and other molecules does seem to affect uh, inflammation at those points. Now, another area that we've been particularly interested in is to try and develop or identify novel targets for drugs that might help protect our endothelium. And one of the enzymes we've been particularly interested in is protein kinase C epsilon. Um, and we, we struck upon this through some uh, fortitude, but Rivka Steinberg joined the group and activated the 
enzymes specifically in the endothelium. And she found that it endowed the endothelial cell with a variety of protective genes. Uh, and these are shown here. And so she showed that it could protect the cells against cell death through the expression of these proteins, against complement, shown here, against inflammation, shown here with this gene, and against oxidative stress. So this was very encouraging to us. And Adil Dumont joined the lab at that point and looked into it in more detail and looked at the molecular mechanisms whereby this might occur. And she showed that activation of the enzyme modulated uh, the activity of this transcription factor so that it directed it away from inflammatory genes and towards these protective genes. And we're looking into how that, that might occur. She also showed that the protein was anti-inflammatory, directly inhibiting TNF-alpha signaling. So very much of interest to the sort of vascular inflammation that I described earlier. Um, but if we're ever going to target these with drugs, we need to understand the signaling pathways in more detail. And so Haley Milroy joined the lab, and during her PhD, she identified some new transcriptional targets. She took an antibody array uh, and identified this transcription factor, CREB, to operate directly downstream of this molecule, and also another protective transcription factor, NRF2. So by activating this protein, we could divert signaling away from uh, pro-inflammatory pathways to protective pathways. And one of the important genes was hemoxygenase 1. And this had become interesting because in 1999, a child was born in Japan who was completely deficient in this enzyme. And unfortunately, he was very sick. He had widespread hemolysis. He had extensive damage to his blood vessels. Uh, and he sadly died at around eight years of age. And at the post-mortem showed accelerated atherosclerosis. So this suggested that this was a fundamentally important enzyme. And we started work on this with uh, collaborators in Turin, Benedetta, uh, Benedetta Bussolati. And what she and I found uh, in our initial studies was that <clears throat> in the process of angiogenesis, the development of, normal, uh, of new blood vessels, um, that this molecule was critically important. It was activated. Uh, it allowed the development of new blood vessels that were reparative, that could repair tissue. But if we interfered with the activity of the enzyme, we didn't switch the angiogenesis off. In fact, we accelerated it, but we converted it into an inflammatory angiogenesis with abundant white blood cells invading tissues, and this was potentially damaging. So we had the hypothesis that if you took a patient with chronic inflammation and you enhanced hemoxygenase 1, you should be able to switch off inflammatory pathways and maintain reparative angiogenesis. And subsequent uh, studies in other groups have shown that that, that does in, uh, indeed occur in inflammatory disease models, including rheumatoid arthritis. But there's still a huge question, and that is how does this enzyme exert its effects, and can we ever really target it directly? So Andrea Bauer joined the lab, and she looked at processes within the angiogenic pathway, uh, including um, cell migration and proliferation. And she showed that the ability to heal a wound in the endothelium required the enzyme. If you took it away, the cells did not migrate and heal the wound as effectively. So she performed targeted transcriptomics and proteomic analyses on these two different types of cells. And she has identified two novel downstream targets, cyclin A1, which is important in proliferation and migration, and vimentin. So we were edging our way towards novel targets. Haley had taken her work forward and shown that hemoxygenase 1 uh, was having additional effects. It was blocking NF-kappa B signaling and so was anti-inflammatory. So we were really moving towards how this molecule could have such an, uh, an all-encompassing and beneficial, uh, beneficial effect. So the final two so science slides look at another side of the drug treatment, and that is to look at drugs that we're already giving to patients to try and understand them better. And some of this work has been driven by Shahir Hamdaleh, who took an observation that we'd made uh, in the laboratory earlier, that these two drugs, the cholesterol-lowering drug and an immunosuppressive drug, when used in combination, as indeed they are post-transplantation, for example, commonly, seem to have a sy synergistic beneficial effect in the endothelium by increasing the complement regulatory protein I mentioned earlier, decay accelerating factor. And he tested this hypothesis in a mouse model. And again, I'm not sure how well this shows, but if you treat with either drug alone or with vehicle, you see no green staining along the lining of the vessel. But when he gave the drugs in combination, there was a marked induction of green staining of the complement regulatory protein along the surface of the cells 
and protecting the vessels. And this may be why this combination is effective post-transplantation. He also took uh, a group of drugs called the, the coxibs, which had fallen into disrepute. They're used in patients with uh, rheumatoid arthritis, for example. But because of Vioxx predisposing to heart attack and stroke, they'd fallen out of favor. But Shahir's hypothesis was that these drugs are not all the same. And he showed quite clearly that celecoxib is different from uh, rofecoxib. It activates a protective pathway shown here, and lo and behold, induces our old friend hemoxygenase 1. And this may uh, be reflected in why this drug, compared to Vioxx, has a slightly better cardiovascular profile. Claire Thornton joined the lab also to ask an important question, and that was, how does methotrexate, a drug that we all use in rheumatology in thousands of patients around the world, and that we knew probably slowed the process of accelerated atherosclerosis that I showed you at the beginning in patients, but we didn't really understand why that is the case, and if we can understand that, we may be able to design a more effective, safer drug to hit that pathway. And Claire has identified this pathway, that methotrexate in the endothelium activates a protective enzyme called AMP kinase. This targets a downstream transcription factor, CREB, that induces many of those protective genes I showed you in an earlier slide. And she showed that if she treated animals with these drugs, that she could see this response. And then in collaboration with uh, Joe Boyle, she used an animal model in which the animals develop inflammation within small arteries in the heart, shown here. And they developed uh, heart attacks, myocardial infarction. She showed that once the disease was established, if she gave the drug, she could exert an anti-inflammatory effect, reducing the red staining in this slide to here. So reducing ICAM-1, a cellular adhesion molecule. This protected against the damaging uh, insult in the arteries, as shown here and gave global protection to the animals against this disease. So again, identifying a target that we may be able to hit with safer, safer compounds in due course. So I would like to thank all of the PhD students I've been lucky enough to work with. Many of them I, I have mentioned, Haley Milroy, Claire Thornton and Andrea Bauer, Anne Kindalira, Saifa Ahmed, Shai Hamdaleh, and Farhad Al Rashed, who is a PhD student in the group at the moment. I co-supervised Alistair Hepburn with Kevin Davis, and with Paul uh, Evans, I co-supervised Nargis Armini and Amalia De Luca, who uh, achieved their PhDs uh, this year. We're also lucky enough to work with very talented scientists within the group. I'd like to recognize Elaine Liddington and Nadira Ali, Rivka Steinberg and Alicia Leda Lara, and previous senior colleagues in the department who've now moved on to other units, but these include Paul Evans, Suzanne Norshaw, Alex Avetic and Clive Landis, and to thank them all again for their hard work and uh, collaboration. But I'd like to give special mention to Danuta Mihues, who has been um, our lab manager for, I don't know if I should give this away, Danuta, but 25 years. Uh, she has worked tirelessly to allow us to do our laboratory research, to make life easy for us in the labs. And I think her greatest achievement, having moved the department about five times, I think, uh, was in 2012 when she moved us this building with, all due respect to Imperial, was a lot better on the inside than it looks on the outside, <laughs> to this wonderful new building here, and we're ensconced on the fifth floor. And so, Danuta, thank you so much for all your efforts over the years. And here we are, uh, a couple of weeks ago, all on the fifth floor in the sunshine. It was a, a good choice of Danuta's to put us on the fifth floor. It's nice and bright. Uh, and this is John Mackey in the group. I should congratulate him. He's just been awarded a distinction in his MSc today. Uh, Alan Kiprianos, Damien Calais, Danuta, and, and Farhad. And um, their projects, and this is the, the last real science slide before I move on to some clinical things, um, is just to illustrate what they're doing in, in, the graph, uh, in, the, in the lab at the moment. So Damien has taken our work into a new area and begun to look at epigenetics and co-regulation of gene transcription. Uh, and in collaboration with Malcolm Parker, he's studying this molecule RIP140 and has generated some really novel data for us uh, in, in this area, which I think will be, uh, will be very well published for him. Farhad is driving forward the, uh, the study of drugs within the endothelium as part of his PhD. And we have two uh, new BHF grants that will drive forward our PKC Epsilon program over the next uh, few years. Now, sport has been a huge uh, part of my life, although less now as I've reached old age. Uh, and I particularly wanted to show my, some of my hockey playing friends, two of whom are here tonight, who I've known both of them for, I'm afraid, guys, over 40 years. 
Uh, but this is the Sherman Pilgrims, uh, and this is the Spencer Harlequins, and who all play hockey very badly. But we have a lot of fun, and we did have for many years. I also escape whenever I can to the River Diva in Hampshire, where uh, I go fly fishing with my brother-in-law, Jules, and we put the world to rights. We rarely catch any fish, but we do enjoy a beer by the river, and then it's all too late anyway to worry too much uh, about that. And in, just in case of you, any of you who still play sport think it's, uh, it's good for you, I'd also like to pay a great respect to my orthopedic surgeon, Justin Cobb, for rebuilding my hip last year. <laughs> so effectively that I managed to get back to the Imperial College staff cricket team against the students uh, again after about 20 years, and we still lost. Uh, we, we were doing that well 20 years ago. Um, so the other part of my work, and perhaps getting back to the theme of the lecture and try to give you some real uh, uh, view of why I called it such a strange title, I, I want to move on to the clinical side of my work, which is every bit as important, and I hope I will convince you that it ties into the research that, I, that I've shown you. And first, I'm going to pay tribute to my clinical colleagues who um, are truly remarkable and have given me every bit of support, as, as Marina kindly said I've given them. But they have been a, a terrific support, uh, support, both in terms of clinical management of patients, but also in research. You've already met Dorian and, and Marina. I'd like to give particular tribute to my colleagues, consultant colleagues, Matthew Pickering, Marisa Karuli, uh, and Michael Nocton, who are all... Uh, consultants within and the trust at the moment. Ravi Rao, I'm delighted to say, still comes and does a clinic with us. He's now in a senior position at uh, GlaxoSmithKline. Our long-suffering um, nurse practitioner, Maria Lukacs, who puts up with us all. Uh, and three colleagues who sadly have moved on to uh, better things. Francesco Carlucci is now a consultant in Oxford. Olivier Harari moved on to a senior position at UCB Celtech. And Tim Vyse is, uh, has moved uh, to King's College. So thank you all very much for everything that you have done for me. And I want to, t to just briefly tell you about two patients I met about 15 years ago who had a big impact on me. Uh, as you will see, they were both very young. I, I met patient A when she was 20 and patient B when she was 27. And patient A had been seeking medical help since she'd been 13 years old. She'd been profoundly tired and unwell, and uh, except for teenage girls, that's nothing remarkable, but she was anemic. And she was back and forward to her GP saying, I'm not right. And he, she was given iron tablets. She went back and forward. Three years later, she went back and said, when I'm running around, I get chest pain. Still no obvious diagnosis uh, had come forward. She then moved to London to come to university, and she thought, well, I'll try my new GP, who sent her straight over to the cardiology department at, Hef uh, at Hillingdon Hospital. Um, they worked out that she had absent pulses in the left arm, uh, and they put her on an exercise treadmill test and found that the heart was ischemic. The second lady was referred to her local hospital, who again followed her very diligently in the, in the clinic, but without establishing the exact diagnosis. She had very similar symptoms, very nonspecific, but markers of inflammation. And again, intriguingly, after about three years, she began to complain of chest pains and pain in the left arm. And they thought, well, maybe she's got accelerated atherosclerosis. But actually, if one looked critically, she had been a smoker, but she didn't really have any other risk factors. Uh, and, and she's a young woman. So it was a little bit unlikely, but not unreasonably. They sent her to the Hammersmith for investigation. She had absent pulses in the left arm, and she was taken to the lab for a cardiac catheter study. Now, what was revealed in the investigations of these two young women was devastating arterial disease. Um, and I think it shows that young people can mask symptoms because, you know, they're otherwise fit. This disease that they suffer from targets the main aorta, arising from the heart and supplying the, the, the rest of the body. And if you look carefully at this scan, this is from a, a normal scan of a patient showing the artery going to the left arm, to the left side of the brain, up to the right side of the brain, and to the right arm. And if you compare this with the same image of patient A, she's lost the artery to her left arm, She's lost the artery to the left side of the brain, and there's a tight narrowing here in this artery. She also had coronary artery disease. Patient B had such a tight narrowing in her main coronary artery that when the cardiac catheter went in, she had a cardiac arrest, from which they did resuscitate her. They inserted a stent to open this up. And I'm delighted to say, 15 years on, that both of these young women are, are still well. But what they were suffering from is this disease. It's called Takayasu's arteritis, or pulseless disease. And this is an inflammatory disease that injures arteries. 
And as you can see on this picture from a common carotid artery of another patient, there's a florid lymphocytic infiltrate here. There's a multinucleate giant cell that fragments the internal elastic lamina. The cells within the artery proliferate, and eventually they occlude the vessel and block it off, as you saw in the arteriogram. Um, and the history behind this I'm going to dwell on just for a couple of minutes because it's quite interesting. Uh, this is Dr. Takeyasu, who was a Japanese ophthalmologist, who chose very wisely to present the first case of this in, in Fukuoka, uh, which is a beautiful part of Japan, as you can see from this slide taken recently. He presented the first case in the 12th annual meeting of the Ophthalmology Society in 1905. Uh, and here is a drawing he made of the back of the eye of the young woman uh, with the disease. But a challenge was put forward in the literature from the Brits who said, no, hold on a minute, we described this uh, earlier. And William Savory published a, a, a case in 1856 in The Lancet. Uh, and this is a remarkable description of a young woman, Anna Maria, in, who was age 22, lived in London and went to St. Bartholomew's Hospital. And he describes day by day her progress. But the Japanese then retorted by saying, well, hold on a minute, we have a book by <laughs> uh, Yamamoto from 1830, Medical Records of My Private Hospital Under the Big Orange Tree, which uh, things were much better in those days. So they regained pole position, and I think fairly confidently thought they were home and dry, until somewhat unexpectedly on the outside, the Italians appear <laughs> with a book, this book by Giovanni Battista Morgagni, from, and uh, Mauro, forgive me for the, present, uh, the pronunciation, from 1761. So I think they're, they're well ahead, unless, of course, uh, you know better. So what I'm about to refer to as Takiasu's arteritis probably should be Morgagni's arteritis. But on a serious note, we decided to see if we could improve the delay in diagnosis that these patients were suffering. And this was the time when novel non-invasive imaging was emerging. And we used magnetic resonance angiography, <clears throat> which defines anatomy extremely well in these patients, here a dilated aorta and uh, occluded vessels, without, of course, any exposure to radiation. Kevin Davis suggested in patient B that we should use the emerging FDG PET scanning to look at her. And she had the normal constitutive uptake here in the heart and in the brain, but clearly abnormal metabolic activity in the arch of the aorta and in the common carotid, suggestive of inflammatory disease. So with Jackie Andrews, Kevin and I studied a, a series of patients asking the question, did non-invasive imaging in the form of these two tests replace the intra- uh, arterial angiography, which of course is much more invasive than I showed you on the previous slides. And what this study showed was that was indeed the case, and it offered the potential of diagnosing these patients a little bit earlier. And Jackie's paper um, was well received and uh, was, was featured on the front of the uh, Annals of the Rheumatic Diseases about 10 years ago now. So since that time, I've taken a, a big interest in this disease. Uh, and we've really tried to use systematically non-invasive imaging that I've mentioned here, uh, ultrasound, here a cross-section through the arch of the aorta in a young woman showing florid inflammation on the PET scan in the wall, localised to the wall of the aorta on a, on a fused CT PET image. And providing the physician thinks about the diagnosis early, we should be able to diagnose this disease and to prevent the widespread damage that can occur in the vasculature. And we drew up in this paper here a, a list of, of red flags to try and alert other physicians to the sort of things to look for in young patients. And occasionally we're lucky. Occasionally we see a patient earlier. And here's perhaps patient C, I should call her. She was 39. And she was investigated quite extensively. No real cause for the very similar symptoms that I described earlier. But she was lucky enough to have an early PET scan. And what this showed was florid inflammation up throughout her aorta. So we treated her starting in 2006 with methotrexate and prednisolone. She finished treatment in 2012 and two years on, now completely off treatment, this is her MR angiogram. She developed no damaging stenotic lesions in the arteries that I described. She had some ectasia in her aorta at presentation, but this has not progressed. So this really encouraged us that if we see the patients early, relatively modest treatment, can improve their, their long-term outcome. And this is beginning to feed through in studies around the world. We've looked at novel imaging techniques, and again, this is the strength of Imperial that we could go to the Brompton Hospital and collaborate with Niall Keenan and Dudley Pennell. They had this very sophisticated MR scanning, which scans the, down through the patient's neck, looking at the major artery in the neck, taking serial sections through it. 
And if you can see this, here is a section through a normal volunteer with normal carotid arteries in the neck. Here's a woman in her 20s with tachyasis arteritis. This artery is thickened, and this one is, is very severely narrowed, and there's inflammatory tissue around it. And what the study showed was that this technique could quantify the carotid artery wall volume. And, and it shows here in the dots the tachyasis patients have considerably thicker arterial walls than the normal controls. So this very sensitive technique should reduce the number of patients with a very rare disease that are required for clinical trials. And there has been no successful clinical trial in this disease to date internationally. So this was an important step for us. We also collaborated with the MRC, uh, with Paolo Camici, to look for more specific PET ligands than the FDG that I showed you. So something that's more targeted for inflammation. And he suggested we tried PK11195 that binds to activated monocytes and macrophages, which we knew were featured in these lesions. And what these proof of principle studies shows is that there were focal areas of inflammation in an active patient here in the wall of the arch of their aorta. We could quantify that signal, and then we could dose escalate their immunosuppressive treatment, and we could rescan and show that we had suppressed the disease activity. So again, a potential way forward for optimizing uh, clinical care. So I'd, um, over the last 10 years or so, have seen about 130 patients with this condition. Uh, and many of them, the disease is controlled either because it had burned out, but we've been able to control it with treatment. Um, however, there's always a subset of patients that relentlessly progress, despite us giving them what we consider optimal treatment. There are some that we get early and we can reverse uh, re reverse their lesions. And I'd particularly like to thank uh, Taryn Youngstein, who's worked with me on this uh, cohort of patients for the last four years. She's been involved in the clinic for two years and in the management and the hard work associated with managing these patients, as well as discussions around treatment and the complex diagnosis. She also pointed out to me that trying to run a specialist clinic and limping as badly as I was was really not a good advert for my <laughs> clinical skills. And really, she said, we need to get this done, something done about it. You're putting the patients off. Um, and so in collaboration with Jimmy Peters, one of the studies that uh, they did together was to try and take this group of patients, th those patients that you scratch your head because their disease relentlessly gets worse. And what we found, again, borrowing ideas from other areas of rheumatology, was that we could use much more targeted therapies, anti-TNF-alpha or anti-IL-6. And of these 10 patients in the initial study, 80% of them had a reduction in their disease activity when they were switched to biologic therapy. And this, of course, depends on us persuading people to pay for it, which is not straightforward. Importantly, this reduced the dependence of the patients on corticosteroids, which give them awful side effects, and reduced the dose, mean dose from 25 to 10 milligrams, and so markedly improved, improved their outlook. So we've been lucky enough to be referred patients from all over the United Kingdom, and indeed from Europe and, and further afield, uh, including a patient on ITU in Tehran. Uh, but it's a huge privilege to us to be uh, referred these patients, and for their willingness to be involved uh, in research, and a lot of this is driven by collaboration with, with uh, charities such as AR UK and Vasculitis UK. And to an extent now, we can begin to offer a sort of personalized approach to therapy. So this is patient D, who was, a, a, was 17 when we first met her. She'd just undergone aortic valve surgery. Uh, she came down from Liverpool, and because of the severity of her disease, we gave her anti-TNF biologic therapy. And we rather congratulated ourselves because she felt better, uh, her prednisolone dose came down, and we rescanned her in seven months later, and she developed a new severe narrowing in the artery in supplying the left arm. So we were then clearly concerned, but because of the experience of other investigators and better understanding of inflammatory pathways, we chose to use tocilizumab, which targeted a different inflammatory pathway, uh, regulated by IL-6. We switched her to that therapy. I'm delighted to say that four years on, uh, she's now come off corticosteroids completely, which is of huge benefit to her. Uh, and her disease is under control. And I think if you compare the narrowing in the artery here to this one from the scan of June this year, there's remodeling of that artery. The damage is beginning to resolve and the flow into her left arm is improved. So clearly an extremely encouraging outcome for us. And our interest in uh, inflammatory diseases, diseases as a whole of the aorta has begun to pull in referrals of related but distinct diseases. And the, 
the novel imaging is beginning to help dissect out these individual diseases that we couldn't do previously. So here's a, a guy of 44 who came down earlier this year from Bolton, and his PET scan doesn't show aortitis. It shows inflammation in, of tissue around the aorta and the branch point. If you look in cross-section, you can see this gray inflammatory tissue here surrounding the contrast medium in, inside the main blood vessel. And we can give very similar inflammatory treatment. We can try and reduce this mass and protect his kidneys from inflammatory disease. This used to be called retroperitoneal fibrosis, but now chronic periaortitis. There's a subtle difference in this patient because the aorta, as you can see, is clearly enlarged. And she has an aneurysm that is a risk of rupture, but she also has inflammatory tissue here. And we hope that the immunosuppressive therapy will reduce that and improve the surgical field for when she has her aneurysm repair. And we are able to do this work because we have a multidisciplinary approach within Imperial and uh, hugely collaborative clinical colleagues in all these different specialties. And all of these uh, people have been involved in various different patients that we have seen. Uh, and the efficacy of this type of approach is illustrated by a, a paper that we published earlier this year with our vascular surgery colleagues from St. Mary's. Uh, between us, we, we looked at 98 patients with tachyasus and looked at all of those who'd undergone surgery of one type or another. And it was quite clear from the findings that uh, Anisha Pereira wrote up was that those patients who had aggressive immunosuppression before surgery, during surgery, and after surgery had a much better outcome. And this is a difficult thing for surgeons to take on board because they're worried quite reasonably about infection. But the evidence is categorical that the outcome is much, much improved. Uh, and I, I really hope we can take this forward. Um, and I also want to reflect that the reason these patients are referred to Hammersmith Hospital is because of the reputation of the institution. And I would particularly like to acknowledge Professor Charles Pusey, who uh, along uh, has encouraged me to, to help him set up a vasculitis centre, collaboration with others, including Tom Cairns, but also people from all the specialties that I've shown you, to really optimise multidisciplinary care uh, for these complex multi-system diseases. And of course this opens up, as well as clinical care, research opportunities. Uh, and this is illustrated by two papers we've published this year. The first was with Sujita Nadkarni and Mauro Preti from QMUL. I'm delighted that they've both come tonight. Uh, Sujita's paper identified a new role for the neutrophil, a type of white blood cell, in another large vessel vasculitis, giant cell arteritis. Um, <clears throat> and this was published in a new hypothesis section of of uh, circulation research earlier this year. But also Ruth Tarzi, my colleague, Charles Pugin and myself, were asked to write a, an article outlining the challenges faced in trying to get together clinical trials in this group. This requires multinational collaboration, and there is no simple answer. Uh, but I think it means that the vasculitis centre that Charles has set up is beginning to be, to be recognised, and Charles will lead us next year when we um, are hosting the 17th International Vasculitis uh, meeting in London, and to which, of course, you're all very welcome. Um, and so finally, then, um, the research opportunities have also been funded by a relatively new funding scheme, the NIHR, um, National Institute for Health Research, uh, Imperial Biomedical Resource Centre. And we're lucky enough to have funding that allows Alan Kiprianos, who's a postdoc in the group, to look at novel biomarker analysis. And in collaboration with Mauro Peretti's group, we're looking at, at biomarkers within the large vessel vasculitis patients, particularly microvesicles and exosomes. In collaboration with Mike Johns and Dorian Haskell, we're looking for novel candidate, uh, looking for, sorry, candidate molecules and screening for novel molecules uh, that we hope will improve the clinical care. And this data will tie in then with imaging studies done by uh, Enrico Tombetti to correlate the two. So I hope that our interest in vascular injury in the lab, our clinical work in vascular injury in the patients will eventually come together so we can develop new treatments, new biomarkers, earlier diagnosis to young patients and improve um, their long-term outcome. So you'll be relieved to know that that is finishing, is me finished. I just want to have a last few thank yous. So the first... Uh, is to Helen Yarwood for putting up with me for so many years, for accompanying me on numerous trips to, on safari to Africa, which is my other great love. The accommodation is not always five star, uh, and some of the facilities are somewhat limited, but practical. Uh, and there's one thing for certain, they, the safari companies would not meet Imperial College health and safety standards. 
Um, but there is an added benefit. We occasionally prevent, uh, persuade friends to join us. And here is Bernie Morley I showed you earlier. And believe it or not, he's now Pro Vice Chancellor of Bath University. I would also like to thank uh, my sister Belle, Jules and their children, Ella, Tom and Alexander, for all the fun over the years, for constantly taking the mickey out of me. And uh, I haven't forgotten my rash uh, promise to take you all on safari. <laughs> I'm still saving. Um, and finally, I'm going to return full circle to my parents to thank them both for their unreserved support. And it reminded me, this slide, just the other day, that um, my mother was a great fundraiser for arthritis research campaign many years before I even did medicine, let alone rheumatology. And it struck me that she was well ahead of the game in terms of getting the sponsor's logo onto your shirt. Because my father is wearing a shirt with the ARC logo. <laughs> so, uh, and I think this was in the 1980s. So sadly, sponsorship was, is not what it was, uh, is not what it is now. So I'm going to finish with this. And it sounds like I read this chap all the time, but it was just a quote of his that I particularly liked. <clears throat> it says, we need wilderness whether or not we ever set foot in it. We need a refuge even though we may never get, need to go there. We need the possibility of escape as surely as we need hope. And thanks to this job, uh, occasionally I do reach the wilderness. Thank you very much indeed. <clears throat>